Kiman. Madam Speaker. I call the Honourable Maggie Barry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to speak at the second reading of the Domestic Violence Victims Protection Bill. Uh, I am a relative newcomer, but I am on the Justice Select Committee and have heard many of the arguments uh, talked about and some of the submitters as well. So uh, my call tonight uh, is to emphasise that I'm very sympathetic to the aims of this bill. I'm sympathetic to the member who proposed it, and as others have said, there is no doubting uh, that member's sincerity and her desire uh, to improve the plight of the victims of domestic violence. We don't agree that this is the way to do it, uh, but I absolutely agree that this is uh, an issue that needs to be addressed. A culture change within this country needs to uh, happen. I do not believe it is an employment issue. I think it is more a health and welfare issue, and I have been speaking with my colleague Hareti Hipango about this, who has had more than 30 years working in the area uh, of law and family violence. And when we look at the measures and protections that are already available under existing law around domestic violence protection orders, uh, stress, medical certificates that will provide leave for people, it does appear to me uh, that this bill uh, takes New Zealand small businesses in a direction that they could not afford. Larger businesses, and there are those in Australia, uh, who have been able to accommodate these kind of uh, leave provisions, when you have a, a team of two or 3,000 employees, that kind of arrangement is relatively easy to achieve. Uh, it does require an enlightened employer, but in a small environment, and New Zealand has a great many small medium enterprises uh, with very uh, small employer bases, which could not afford and could not sustain uh, an individual taking an additional two working weeks leave for domestic violence. So when we discuss this at select committee level, and looked at the way in which, uh, for example, a corner dairy might cope uh, with having somebody uh, come in to work and say, I need time off for domestic violence leave now. Uh, and at that time, and I see it's back in the bill, uh, there is also a provision for a support person to also take leave uh, to be able to assist to drive the person who is the victim uh, and so forth. But again, in a very small employment situation, it is almost impossible to imagine that being able to work without seriously undermining the business uh, and, and therefore uh, endangering the jobs not only of the people who are the victims of domestic violence, uh, but also those who are employed by the small medium enterprise. So we felt it was impractical at that level. Uh, we support the spirit of the bill, absolutely, but look at what it seeks to do. The bill proposes to make changes to five acts. The Domestic Violence Act, Employment Relations Act, Health and Safety at Work Act, Holidays Act and Human Rights Act. Uh, when we look at the uh, Employment Relations Act uh, to allow employees who are victims of domestic violence uh, to request a variation of their working arrangements, and then under the Holidays Act to have those 10 paid days leave, uh, we are starting to see building up a very difficult and very uh, difficult to sustain long term for a small business uh, any of the opportunities uh, that, that might exist to, to support somebody who has been a victim of domestic violence. Uh, when we were in the committee and in reading the papers and the advice from officials, uh, we were provided with many examples of employers who were doing the right thing, who are recognising and providing appropriate support, flexibility and leave for employees who are affected by domestic violence and who need to uh, suddenly go and see a lawyer, go and uh, take their children from school to medical appointments and so forth. Any of us who have raised a family know very well how quickly we need to be able to respond as parents uh, to the needs of our family, particularly uh, if we are also in a situation uh, where there is a domestic violence uh, overlay. Uh, when we see employers willing to take action and that there are measures and provisions within existing laws uh, to enable that action to occur, one starts to wonder what the real advantages of this particular bill would be. So while at discussion at Select Committee, we all agreed that there needed to be 
uh, not only enlightened employers, uh, but also uh, a, an awareness campaign for the public uh, so that victims of domestic violence, employers and everyone else, frankly, in this country who are not aware, to be aware of what they are allowed under the law and what the provisions are. Um, the flexibility and leave provisions uh, do already exist. Uh, the employers have a responsibility under the Health and Safety at Work Act to provide a safe workplace, including protections while at work against threats that may be posed to a victim of domestic violence. So the opportunities for individuals uh, who are uh, victimising their, their partners, for example, or someone in their wider family, uh, to come into the workplace and to threaten partners, um, they're, they're, uh, they can be blocked in their access. Uh, uh, not only physically into the workplace, but also via email or telephone. Employers are required under existing law to consider requests for flexible working arrangements, and that's provided for in Part 6AA of the Employment Relations Act. And employers must provide sick leave under the Holidays Act for an employee whose physical or mental health is affected by domestic violence. And I would suggest to the member and to others who are in agreement with this uh, legislation that the, uh, the, the additional measures within this bill are not ones that are going to comprehensively change the landscape, uh, but they will uh, in a very real and meaningful way uh, make it very difficult uh, for small and medium enterprises uh, to accommodate victims of domestic violence. Uh, I mean, really, in, in terms of the essence of this bill, if you are, and if, if an employer uh, decided that they would not allow domestic violence leave, then in the provisions of this, they can do that. They can turn it down on the basis that it would be uh, difficult for them to be able to afford it. Uh, and that is a provision that uh, an employer could easily and readily use. There are rights of appeal, and we talked around those, but, but uh, ultimately it would be very difficult uh, for the person who is the victim of domestic violence uh, to argue against an employer who said, uh, this cannot be afforded, uh, this business will go under if we have to allow these provisions, so I'm going to turn it down. So ultimately, uh, how much real... Uh, real momentum and real power would come from this bill. I would suggest nothing very much. There is nothing stopping employers from offering more in addition. And as I said at the Select Committee, we have heard uh, a number of uh, excellent examples of um, ways in which employers have accommodated uh, the domestic violence issues of victims because they want to keep these good staff, because they want to support them, because they're human beings who understand on that human level how important it is uh, to have a supportive working environment. Uh, if, you, if, a, if an employer has spent a lot of time training and uh, nurturing an individual who is an employee, uh, that employer is going to be highly motivated to, to try and keep that person and support them through a time of stress. And so given the, uh, the ability of an employer to act flexibly now, uh, to offer more in addition, why would we not, through awareness and uh, public awareness campaigns in particular, uh, ensure that people know to ask and know to request it from an employer? I think the additional administrative requirements under this bill uh, were too extensive uh, for us to support. Uh, providing 10 days leave for a support person does require employees to provide domestic domestic violence documents, such as a police complaint or a statement from domestic violence support organisations. So uh, there is a, a lot of additional material that would be required. I think the, uh, the, the, uh, the SOP, in the name of my colleague Mark Mitchell, uh, which we'll go into in more detail uh, at, at another time, is a very good compromise. And uh, we need to do all that we can to reduce domestic violence. So uh, the measures that he has outlined, a more moderate change that makes it clear to employers that the reasons associated with domestic violence are valid ones uh, for granting annual and sick leave, uh, but that that be taken within the existing provisions. So uh, when we look at what is around at the moment, uh, we already have four weeks of annual leave. We have 11 days of public holidays, five days of sick leave and three days of bereavement leave and they are provided currently under the present law. There is within that uh, a very 
uh, it's a, it can be a very big burden on some employers, and we are genuinely fearful and have spoken with a number of employers who do not feel that they would be able to, in addition to those provisions that already exist, uh, to, to allow an additional two weeks of paid leave, 10 extra days. Um, so the SOP, with, uh, with which Mark, uh, the Honourable Mark Mitchell will be tabling, uh, is one that uh, I think will be uh, enlightening for many of the members. Labor didn't agree to have a support person. Labor didn't agree to the 10 days unless it was limited to 12 months. So there are a number of difficulties with this bill, order, order. which is I why we don't support it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. I call the Honourable Tracy Martin. Kia ora, Madam Speaker. Kia ora. I rise on behalf of New Zealand Food.